Golka built his lightning machine from surplus parts and set it up in the middle of the old Wendover hangar. In 1978, the Air Force awarded him a small contract zapping model fighter planes with lightning bolts. But generally, over his nine-year tenure at Wendover, Golka landed only a handful of low-budget contracts, financing most of his self-made research out of his own pocket. His eccentric science agitated city fathers, and he took a lot of flack from townspeople. The bitter feelings remain with Golka even today. Those people were very small-minded and certainly wouldn't understand the magnitude of what I'm doing. And, you know, it's kind of like going to the pygmies and asking them how a digital wristwatch works. Now, after five years, Robert Golka returns to the snows of Colorado, the top of an 11,000-foot mountain and this large metal building near Leadville. Echoes of Wendover, Robert Golka's machine, patterned after the original 1899 Nikola Tesla coil, is up and zapping again. I'd do this work for nothing uh, for the rest of my life. It's, it's fascinating. It's better than being a millionaire and having Rolls Royces and uh, big homes around the country because yeah, that wears out. This doesn't. There's always a new challenge. The machine here looks like the Wendover version because it is. Golka trucked most of the parts from the Wendover hangar. Again, he's financing everything out of pocket. It's not profitable to do research in pure science. I'm kind of one of the unusual characters that like to go into this area. I enjoy it. Making money bores me to death. It really does. Robert Golka still hopes to create a bit of ball lightning, although he claims he reproduced the anomaly last year aboard a Boston Railroad locomotive. But now he wants to take his backyard research one step beyond, literally, from the top of this 150-foot tower to the ionosphere, a thin membrane 50 miles above the Earth that encircles the globe. Like Tesla in the 1800s, Golka believes if you resonate or charge this membrane called the Schumann Earth cavity, it might transmit electricity without transmission lines. Suddenly we discover that Tesla had already excited the cavity, used it for transmitting small amounts of power, measured it, and, and had the dimensions and the frequency all worked out as far back as 1899. Next summer, Golka will charge the tower with 12 million volts DC and discharge it at eight cycles a second, the so-called resonance frequency of the Schumann cavity. If this works, I mean, we're going to have a worldwide powered grid system that we can sell power to countries like Africa or third world countries uh, in South America and it will bring the world lot close together. In theory, then, a wireless source of power encircling the Earth that any country could tap into. Golka doesn't draw much support from scientific agencies or his colleagues, so he's financing this project on his own again, some $40,000, he says. <laughs> but he loves tinkering with electricity and claims he'll prove his science someday, despite the skepticism. The thing is, you have to be able to make your own decisions without having to go to a board meeting and convince a committee. I mean, that's the whole problem. And if you've got something that people recognize, they're going to come to you and they'll bend to your way of life, not to the other way around. The trick is uh, you have to maintain your own individuality. And, you know, we're losing that dress terribly in this country. We go to universities, we get conditionedized to the point that, uh, well, we got to be like everybody else. And I say fully on that. Like the real McCoy from his Tesla coil, Robert Golka zaps his critics with verbal lightning. The Alexander Graham Bells and the Henry Fords are in Japan now, he says. And that's where all the new independent science is unfolding. many were aware of it, but during April, the Aeronautical Systems Division from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio came to Utah 
to zap a $60,000 model plane with man-made lightning. This is where it all happened inside an abandoned hangar at the old Wendover base in Utah's western desert. Robert Golka, the Utah scientist who has built what many now claim is the largest Tesla lightning coil in the free world, provided almost the same conditions a plane and crew might undergo during a heavy storm. This lightning coil, by the way, can generate as much as 18 to 30 million volts, and for a small model, that could be almost the same as the real craft being subjected to a real storm, and 80 to 90 million volts. The Ohio-based research team that came to Utah have been trying to find out why the new planes made in this country have been going down in storms. This model cost a meager $60,000, but in the crash of the real thing, the F-111 that went down recently in Europe, it was $14 million and the end for two Air Force pilots. The problem is a major one since the new lightweight planes have little if no shielding against lightning. The planes are covered with an epoxy-like material embedded with small metal fibers. These fibers can actually attract lightning instead of repel it, something the manufacturer didn't expect. But that's only half of it. The planes are also equipped with highly sensitive computer guidance systems, and when the lightning strikes, the systems are knocked out and the pilot loses control. Most have manual connections, that is, the pilot controls the plane through direct mechanical link-ups. But on the new F-16s, for example, the connection is all electronic through a computer. And if that goes out, the pilot has no option but to bail out. The manufacturers have an answer. Let's continue to build the planes and work out the bugs as we go along. But at $14 million a crack, the Air Force says it can't wait and is now spending three quarters of a million dollars in tax revenue to prove to the manufacturers that the lightning anomaly is real. So again, this is what the Air Force is attempting to prove. First, the small metal fibers create a field attracting the lightning. And since they cannot carry the current when the lightning strikes, they explode, tearing holes in the aircraft shell. Second, the current is carried to the small voltage computer guidance systems, knocking them out, and the end product is total failure. The dilemma is a costly one. A spokesman for the group that tested the model plane at Golka's Wendover lab says the experiments there and in Ohio are proving the theory. In fact, they say they are already looking at methods to shield and harden the aircraft shell, expensive changes on existing planes. And in some cases, there's simply no room left to add the additional shielding, and new designs may be required. This is Ed Yates, Dimension 5. We should mention the Tesla light... Robert Golka is perhaps the most unique of the backshop geniuses. For even though this may look like something right out of Dr. Frankenstein's lab, its inventor is really a legitimate scientist who's isolated himself in Utah's western desert in hopes of creating ball lightning. Volka is the president of his own electronics research company. The Irene Research Institute in Provo has now given him a grant to create and study this quirk of nature to see if its still secret containment of energy might have an application for future hydrogen fusion devices. The ball lightning device that zaps lightning bolts is appropriately housed in this old hangar at the abandoned Wendover Air Force Base on the Utah-Nevada border. Now, as a converted back shop, it only whispers the memories of the war years and the famed B-29 that dropped the first atomic bomb over Japan. But it's this kind of atmosphere that Golka likes, for he believes that working here in the desert at his own speed is the only way an inventor, a scientist, can think and create.
It's uh, very relaxing. You can work at your own pace. You can think out things clearly. And uh, if you do get in a sort of a bind, or as Edison used to say, up against the stone wall, you can sit, out, sit down at the piano or take a walk around the base and uh, sort of cleanse your mind, so to speak, and come up with the solutions to problems that you're trying to solve. An inventor writing in a national trade magazine says, the creative person is essentially a perpetual child. The tragedy is that most of us grow up, but not everyone does grow up in the creative sense. Somehow, a few retain or rediscover the charm, the interest, and the excitement that is a way of life with the creative person. Alfred Binet says, I find that images appear only if we give our ideas uncontrolled freedom when we are dreaming while awake. As soon as full consciousness, voluntary consciousness returns, images weaken, darken. They seem to withdraw to some unknown region. Then the inventor continues, that's so true. And that's why when we're looking to the creative solution to a problem, it's important to stuff the mind with all of the A's and B's we can find. Think about them and the problem often, and then relax and turn the whole shooting match over to that unknown region we often call the subconscious or unconscious mind. And let it cook for as long as necessary. Then, when we least expect it, when we are dreaming while awake, the idea we're looking for will appear. It will come skipping into our minds like a small child, and just as ready to run away and hide if we're not very careful. A perfectly wonderful, fresh new concept, a new, original idea. We lie there, holding this brainchild, a wonderfully apt expression, gently poking and probing it with our consciousness looking for possible flaws like a new mother seeking her child for the first time. But there it is, and that's the way it works with the inventor.